going to continue with the study that we started last week. We were talking about the gifts that Christ has given us. So what's the purpose of these gifts for each of the believers? So this is a really important part. So Ephesians 4, 12 through 16. believer's gift has three parts. Each are specific that that will help us in the purpose of these gifts that we have. So you notice this picture it involves the church and the believers right here in the center. And the various works like um, some are doctors, Ministers, police, mechanics, chemists, out there in the workforce, and then come here to church, all the believers, and are working together, each of their own professions. God has given giftings to each of individual. In the beginning, in the church, in the beginning of time, like a believers, God chose 12 apostles to establish the church. In Revelation, very in the Bible, the apostles will be will, will enable us through the time, allowing the ministry of God to go through the whole world. So we continue with God's ministry. And the elders, and the leaders, and some are pastors and teachers. And some are encouragers. As we each learn the word, these are the gifts that God has given to the believers. So we think, who are the gifts for? The gifts are for the saints. And the saints, that's you. Well, I think that's kind of an unusual word. We don't use that these days. The saints. I think maybe it refers to the Catholics. But no, we are the body of Christ. We are the saints. Those who are called are the saints. It means we are children of God. So the three purposes of the equipping is Ephesians 4.12. The gifts are specific. It's very clear what the meaning is involved in these gifts. We get these, we receive these gifts from God to serve for his purpose. This is really interesting to see. God is helping his people. In Ephesians 4, 12. The word equipping. I think what is that word mean? Equipping. It's different than like equipment. Different resources, different equipment, things. So you see this boy with his broken arm? He has a cast on his arm. And you yourself have experienced getting injured yourself and breaking a part of your body. When I was a kid, I frequently would fall and injure myself. So, you know, an elderly person needs to be very careful because their bones are very careful they don't fall. So this is a really interesting word, equipping. The Greek word means, is an old Greek word, catatarsis, 
catatarsinosis. From the same word family as cartesia. It's a medical term. In the Greek, meaning denoting the setting of a bone. So when the bone is broken, it needs to be reset. That's a good use of this word. So like in surgery, different kinds of surgery will have in the preparation of and resetting. Evangelists and prophets and teachers and pastors. What is this for? It's for equipping. Also for mending, for fixing. The same as like a doctor. Like the spirit within inside of us. Sometimes if we're feeling kind of out of it, a little bit out of whack, but facing problems in life or family, or children are rebelling, or finances are tough, different situations in our life, and these problems that we face daily. It's like this church is like our hospital. And we come inside here, and we receive from the Holy Spirit, same as if you would go to a doctor if you were injured, and you're hearing the word from a pastor, the things in your life will be set back right, things that we struggle with, and we come and we hear the word of God. We're receptive and hear what God has for us. It will change and transform and fix our life. So the Bible is given to us for health. For our inside health, for our spirit, for our soul. It's God's purpose for us. And how we live healthier depends on the Holy Spirit. Ourselves alone, we do not have the power. We don't have the authority within ourselves. We don't have the magic way to fix things. But the Holy Spirit's working inside of us in our heart, slowly changing as a process of our growth, of our Christian life. So that's what this word means, the equipping. is helping us, the saints. See, the equipping is a process for the work in the ministry, for the believers. Those who are a child of God, God gives us the gifts. This is so important, the saints. Many people will go to church but maybe not be believers. Those in the world are not comfortable with things of the church and things of God. But God has set up his church. So like people will come to church and they don't know the traditions of the church, they're not used to communion. But the believer, we, we're accustomed to that. We know what God's word has for us, what we experience through church. Maybe 15 or 16 times. A while back, the Lutheran Church was really split. They experienced many, many problems. Many secular problems that were not Christian or related to the world. Lawyers, politics, politicians, the police, they come into the church. And they would want to take the bread and the cup. But they were not true believers. And there would be arguments among them. It's 
So there was a fence that was set up. So the believers were on one side of the fence, and the non-believers, the worldly people, were on the other side of the fence. And those who did accept Jesus were allowed to come inside the fence and to be with the believers. So this is in the history, I'm just going to go on a little bit. So the altar is open for those to come and to partake of the bread and the cup. So God's gifting of the gifts, who is it for? It's for you. It's for you and me, all of the believers. God doesn't give gifts out into the world to the non-believers, but God gives these giftings to the saints, to those who believe in Christ. And his teachers and apostles and leaders and preachers and missionaries, those are the gifts that God has given to the believers. Hmm. So we get the gifts, do we keep it to ourselves? The gifts that God has given is for the working of the ministry. different service that we do as Christians. So this Greek word we use in English we use service. The Greek word diakonias is where we get the word deacon. like a deacon, an elder, and leaders. But the word itself in our English means service. God has given us these gifts to serve others. Like in Sunday school, we teach the children. And we have a special ed class that we teach. And we're ministering, we're serving. God's given us these gifts to serve each other. Everything that we do is in service. Our songs, our worship. And the one who's responsible for the PowerPoints. There's different kinds of service here, right here in our church. The one who heads out the program. That is serving. Everything that we do. We are working in service. So this word that I was studying, it came from Acts chapter 6. And it really expanded on what we were just talking about. So when the churches were established, and when they started to grow throughout the world in all of the area of the people, the people would be hungry and they needed food. And the Jewish people, they kept themselves as a specific group, specifically focused on them. But then there was another group that was specifically focused on the Greek people. But when they would gather together, and the others would see, and they would be hungry, and they would want to join in with that, you know, there would be complaints among the group. And then people were saying, hey, you know, your leaders, your priests, your, you know, all of these different people that are in there, they don't like us, <coughs> they're ignoring us. They're not serving us. They only serve the one group, the Jewish group, the Hebrews. And they noticed that, yes, that was right. But they were making a mistake. They were hungry for the word. And then they were thinking what to do. So then they went out amongst all the others. And they, those, they were particular people that wanted to be in service. And they picked the five people. And they became servers. And this was the gift that was given to them. And they went through all of the people. And the Holy Spirit gave them the wisdom that they needed. So we see that Peter also blessed these people. And he made them deacons. He called them deacons. And this was the beginning of the ministry of the, 
of deaconry, that they would support people, that they would help them in their poverty or in whatever it was that they needed. And that is what they were speaking about when they speak of the work of service, ministry, all the work that's involved, all the work that's involved in all of these gifts that God gives us. So then we look to this and we see that we look to see the purpose when we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, and then we go down further through 16, we see what these gifts are for. The meaning of them, the gift is for, and who is it given to? What is the gift given for? What profession, what ministry, what reason do these people get? And it says right here in the highlighted verse, for the edifying, for the building up of the body of Christ. So see on here, on, on the picture of Christ, you see all of these people that are added in, all of these people have their own service. And this caused the building, the edification of the church because of all of these gifts that were given. Because all of these people become the body of Christ and they all offer their own service. So these gifts, their purpose is for helping and to edify and for building the body of Christ. We can't do things alone. We can't just look around and just do it alone. You know, somebody may need help and you need to join in. And we make a team. You know, when you hear deaf stories or you hear a deaf story, and we've been hearing those for, for years, or you see them, you watch them. And you know, there's a house where people did not have enough to eat. It was a terrible place. And the community itself was very poor, and all of the houses in the community were very poor. They didn't have enough to eat. But one house had a lot of soup. They had chicken soup, chicken noodle soup, great big vat of it. But they didn't really have much meat. They didn't have any vegetables. But they had this great big vat. And then it smelled really delicious, and it seemed to taste really good. So what they did was they went around and they said, hey, do you have an onion? Do you happen to have some sort of vegetable? Do you have something that we can add to it? And they went through to all of these people, and they brought it back to this great big pot. And it was like a community pot. And all the people came and put in what they had. And they shared what they had. And it's like, you know, I'll help you, I'll do, you know, I'll clean these vegetables, I'll get them all nice and clean, and I'll cut this up in the corn, and I'll cut the carrots up, and I'll, and then we'll boil it together, and we'll simmer it, and let it grow, and then they passed it out, and everybody was able to enjoy it. But if you just said, no, just me, just me, it's only for me, you know, and if you had, like, just an onion to eat, and that's all you had to eat, think of it, I mean, you'd be sitting there sobbing as you're, like, doing that. You know how bunnies will sit there, and they'll eat carrots, but all by themselves. It's always the same. But with everybody adding what they had, it made this wonderfully delicious soup. So it's important that we think of this when we think everybody putting in their gift. And it's sad that so many people today are selfish. They refuse to help other people. They say, it's not my responsibility. No, I'm just going to hold it myself. We all have gifts, and we all need to share we can't be stingy with our gifts and say, I'm not helping you. I'm not going to help you. Not, oh, I'm just going to stand here. You can't do that. God has given you a gift. Each one of us has a gift. And our gift is for building, for the edifying, building, the growth and the maturity for the body of Christ. Just as this picture shows us, the one goal is to establish a unity, a fellowship, not to step aside and say, no, 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 you just me. No, you go in and you join whatever skill you have. You join with someone else, and every time you do, it makes it stronger as you bring people together. If you're only by yourself, you're weak. You can't do everything by yourself. But with people helping one another, reaching out to one another, you know, if it's some people are just so cold and they just won't join in and they, they set themselves boundaries.
But God has given us a gift with a purpose that we all come together and we lift up his body. Now, the first point was the importance of gift. When we have gotten them, and for the edification, you know, and that kind of goes on. But then after a while, you just want to sit back and say, yeah, no. You know, like it's like when you're driving in your car, and you know, you just sort of see things, and then you see people, and you say hi, and then you leave, and same old, same old thing. Not really interesting. People don't get involved. They don't get involved in service. We need to serve. We need to serve. It's a very important, very vital thing. For we have an eternal purpose. So we will look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, and look at it a little bit, a little bit more closely. <coughs> so we notice this line, really important line that it says, that Christ gave us spiritual gifts until we all come to the unity of the faith. Unity of the faith. You know, yesterday we had the wedding. Two became as one flesh. Jen and James were married. Before they were apart, and now they are together as one. And they will go through their life together in unity. And the point is, the purpose is, is that God brings us together to build us up, that we might all become as one. And Ephesians speaks of this. It spoke of that in verses 6 and 7. One God, one baptism, one Lord, one faith. One, 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 and we see that. One. No division. So we see here that the discussion continues with the giving of the gifts. We're to share our gifts. We're to spread them out. We're not to just hold them to ourselves. We are all to come together and share them for this purpose of unity, this purpose of oneness, of togetherness, that we might become one as we all joined together. And Paul was doing this to encourage the Ephesians. And he was telling them that their goal was for unity with God. You know, all throughout the world, there are all these different kind of churches that say hospitality and say, you know, say that they're together. But in this church, we work together to become as one body of Christ. So when we look at these message verses that are in the boxes, and we see the importance of unity of the faith. But also, look at this. The knowledge. The knowledge of who? It's very clear. The knowledge of the Son of God. That all of us come together in unity to turn to one God, to one Lord, Jesus Christ. And we are all to become involved in the service to this for the Son of God. And that's why Jesus said, everyone must come to me. And he was saying that the Son of God is a living God. He's a real God. When you read, yesterday when we were reading through the verses, and while well, Jen and James had written, um, we wrote... We, was, we spoke about the ABCs of, of spirituality and saying, admitting that there was one true God, admitting this, that we all look to Jesus Christ, that we all look to him alone, that we all come together and work for the one glorious church in heaven, the beautiful, the most wonderful edifice in church. But what it means is that People do not get the glory, but all of us work together to turn our focus on God, to learn from him, to study from him, to build up his name, to follow what Jesus has taught us. Now we know in Matthew that it says, very, very famous verse that it says, We obey all that God has taught us and that all the world may look to us and learn about Jesus Christ. 
Now, there are other philosophies in the world as well. There's a ton of them all over the place. You know, people talk about business, people talk about riches, and all of the other different things that they have. But for us, our goal is relationship with Jesus Christ, and that is our one goal. So we see that these gifts have been given to us for a specific reason. And then if we look down, and this is very important to notice that it says, to a perfect man. So all of us that have come together who all know each other, a perfect man. And the Greek word <coughs> actually speaks until the end, to the completion of perfection of a perfect man. So that actually, what it's really speaking of is the maturity of a man. You know, for once something has begun. So, so look at that little clod of dirt with a little plant in it. What is the goal of that? So if you watch that picture, and you see behind it, the goal is that it will mature itself. Mature, notice that. It says, to the measure of the stature in the fullness of Christ, fullness of Christ, 100% in Christ. So all of us that come together, when we come in unity, we come in faith, we come believing on the Son of God, we become mature until our completion, until our maturity is complete. Just like that little plant would grow up into a tree. Because remember the picture that we have of the body of Christ, how everybody is in it. Everybody, until it reaches its fullness in Christ. And the fullness will happen when Jesus comes again. We don't know when he's going to come. We don't know. But we are to continue. We are to continue to spread the gospel, spread the good news, preach the good news throughout all of the world. Go out and do ministries. Go out and do missionary work. And all along, the body of Christ will be growing with the branches, all of it coming to fruition, all of it coming to the end, until the time when the earth ends, when there is no more earth, and we look to see Jesus coming to us again. So the purpose of eternity is our personal purpose. Ephesians chapter 4, 15 to 16. <coughs> Your personal goal. There's beautiful songs, there's struggles, all my frustrations, and my troubles. I should no longer be negative. You don't need to live a negative life. We're constantly negative in everything that we do and our actions are behaviors. This needs to stop. Our church is negative. It's awful to continue in negativity. We no longer need to be negative. When we're mature, we're growing in Christ. We get rid of our negativity. We focus on negative and dwell on negative. Like my wife and I, you know, we wake up, we get up in the morning. When we're talking about something, maybe something negative comes up. You kind of stick with that all day, and you don't feel good for the whole day because we start the morning negative. So you know that's just a picture. Like my wife and I, we discuss we want to wake up and be positive, feel, wake up on the right foot. Otherwise, we live in this negativity and ruins the whole day. So this other word here, no longer be like a child. <coughs> and this Greek word, infectious, you're like this baby, a little baby stuck in the stem, but we as mature believers, we've grown, outgrown this immature lifestyle. You know, children, you need to warn them and always look out for them, but as the baby grows and matures, they're more capable of themselves. You know, being immature, I mean, 
not being mature, we're dependent on others. We need to grow up and become mature ourselves. And not to dwell on negativity. And sometimes like a young know, kid will be negative, more pitching, always be complaining and whining. We need to grow up and become mature. So we're going to focus on this, be like a wave. I so enjoy going out to the ocean, being out at the beach and watching the waves coming in on the sand and rolling back and forth. Many people enjoy going out and watching the waves, being at the beach. But the Bible says, don't be like the waves. It's like negative influence coming in on it's called like doubt, false teaching, or faith, you know, a strong belief in God. I remember when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and the waves were tossed about. The waves like represent our life, like negativity and doubt and problems in our life. And Jesus was able to calm the waves. Jesus got on the boat, was rocking back and forth, and Jesus was able to fall asleep through all that. And the apostles are screaming like, God, wake up, calm the sea, it's so crazy out here. And Jesus woke and spoke to the waves, and the sea became calm. So like we're sitting on the beach, and just imagine, waves coming in, going out. It's kind of like doubt and our frustrations and the things in our life that really throw us through. Just think of every wave that's tossed and every wind of doctrine. So many times today there's all kinds of teaching. People want to add to the Word of God. And you hear all of this. And there's different beliefs, different doctrines that are taught. It's like the waves like, and the wind that's blowing the things around. And like young children, they are susceptible to believing many different things. So we look over here, the deception, the trickery. So like today we teach we don't want false teaching. Something very famous, how to gain well. Somebody thinks, oh, they're going to buy something and become wealthy. Or this quick action plan to become wealthy. But God's teaching us to be good stewards of our money, to give them tithe. You know, sometimes you see something on TV, maybe an evangelistic preacher on TV, and they said, send it for them. Well, send it for these children who are hungry and poor. And you're so compassionate, you started sending money to these on TV, and they promised that they're going to do all these good works, and they said that they're going to give you something in addition because you are supporting their ministry. But then when you realize what's going on with this TV evangelist, and he lives in this huge mansion, they got a swimming pool, massive cars that he owns. He's got these gaudy rings all over his fingers. But yet he's saying, please give to the hungry. You're supporting all these missions. Send in your money. Support my ministry. We have to be careful, be cautious of the lies and the deceit. So I just want to warn you to be aware of this false teaching, false doctrine. And some people teach to, you know, give to my ministry, yet they themselves become a millionaire, and they are doing no good. 
But God's word is free. The Holy Spirit is available to all. God sees this and knows this. God knows these TV evangelists and their deceitfulness and the wealth they're gaining for themselves. And the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Maybe one, two, or three times. And we keep pulling back these layers and looking to see what's really going on. You know, sometimes you watch a movie and you're excited you know, to watch the movie in full. And then you go to another movie. And you see how much money that they're making from these movies. It's like never enough. They continue earning all this money. It's like a thievery. So this word negativity is negative. Now what's the opposite of that? To be positive. It's a nice bright green that represents the positive. That would be yours. Where we respond in speaking the truth in love. We speak the truth. The truth shall set you free when you know the truth. The truth shall set you free. So starting at 16, it says from home, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, will cause growth. Same as this little plant, this little seedling that was set, grew into this big tree. The whole body, for the purpose of the whole body, all of us together, not individually, not separately. Ephesians 4 and 16. This is one faith, one baptism. Working together with a whole body in Christ. And those who work and serve in the church, our purpose is to work and strive together for the body of Christ. Through our praise and our worship at church and our decoration, that, that stuff. The decoration of the church isn't important. What is important is the edification of the saints, the building up each other to become one body in Christ and through the Son of God. So it recognizes we're joined together. In the home, the whole body joined and knit together but every joint supplies. You know, there's many church splits and church breaks and separations. When people feel cold and talk negatively against the church. We need to be supportive of each other and not to be negative and be deconstructing each other, but to be positive and constructive for each other. When you're negative, you tear down each other. You know in those Psalms? They said many people will exalt themselves, but Christ will tear them down. And you know, today, you know, some of us have allergies at this time of the season. People are talking negatively and tearing down Trump. All of the liberals speak negative. They're against him, trying to destroy Trump. You know, the Psalm of David, it's that those in authority, and their reputation is being destroyed. The Psalm of David 
says God will be our support and our strength. I don't know how Trump handles this accusation day in and day out. He must really have some thick skin. He sees the accusations all the time. Maybe he's just getting used to it. I think I would quit and leave the presidency. I have enough. It's been two and a half years now. And it's been going ongoing. People said it would be a short presidency, but it's still going. But God himself is sovereign. He is in control. God has all authority. But our purpose now is not to be influenced by the outside world, not to have the church divided, not to tear down each other, not to speak negatively about each other, and not to bully or harm each other with our words and our actions. We are called to love and speak truth to each other and build each other up. That is our purpose. We join together and support, support of each other. We help each other through sharing, like the story I mentioned earlier, and our different skills and abilities that we have. If we're able to work collaboratively as a team, That is building up the body. That's building up each other. And not tearing each other down. But being supportive of each other. Each one of us working together in unity. Same as Paul has explained. So the success of each other is through the growth. The growth of the body of Christ. All of our giftings working together, we will grow and mature together. So we're going to build each other up in love. That's it, in love. Always, everything that we do is done in love. We're working together in edification through love. See our little hearts here. They're simple of love. But if we don't have love, we're so mean and destructive and judgmental and talking negatively and always against each other and at each other's throats. But through love, the hostility can be resolved. It brings a change in our heart. First Corinthians chapter 13. talks about the troubles. But if we have our faith and our work in love, we have faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these, faith, hope, is love. But if we don't have love, we are nothing. There is strife and envy among us. Kind of like a dog starting to growl at each other and how they kind of approach each other angry. But love brings friendliness and an open heart for each other. So now for our inclusion, conclusion. When we think about what we've learned in this part of the chapter today about God's gifts and how he gives them to help a person. We see in 1 Corinthians, going back to chapter 12, verse and remember, there's so many chapters in Corinthians 12, 13, 14. But there is a, um, in the New Life Translation Bible of that, that says that there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. All of these gifts are not given the same. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5, there are different kinds of service. You can cook, some can paint, some are skilled at, at yard work, some are good mechanics. All are different. 
but understand that all of us, we serve the same Lord. You can say, well, I'm better than he is. No, you're not. You have a skill. This person has a skill, and we work together. Remember, we work together as our goal is the Lord. We don't want to be causing division amongst ourselves. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6, it says God works in different ways. It's not the same for each and every one of us, but it is the same God who does all of the work in us. That is the same, the same God who works in amongst all of us. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, it says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we may help one another. What we are to do with whatever skill or talent God has given us is not to step back and to say, it's not my responsibility, I don't have to do that. But to come together, I mean, come together and help one another, to encourage one another. You know, when people have such a problem, then they need help, and we need to grow together as the body of Christ. And remember, in Ephesians chapter 4, as we have been discussing, Paul was trying to encourage these people. And in Ephesians chapter 3, he was speaking about not to be divided, how there was division between the Jews and between the Greeks, and he wanted them to all come together in one body of Christ. So whether they were Jews, whether they were Romans, whether they were slaves, whether they were free men, they were all to be one in Christ. You know, deaf, hearing, different kinds of people throughout the world, one in Christ. It doesn't matter what race, what ethnicity you are, we are all one with Christ. We are all to come together as one with Christ. You know, often some people say, oh no, white, or black, or Chinese, or no, no, no. That's a negative reaction. We come together as the body of Christ to work together in unity. I help you, you help me, we all help another in, in fellowship. 